In tonight's opening exhibition lecture, we hope to give you a glimpse at some of the complex themes that are represented throughout the exhibition. Curated by our very own Alejo Benedetti, Men of Steel, Women of Wonder uses Superman and Wonder Woman to explore national identity, American values, social politics, representation, and the concept of humanity. The conversation this evening can't possibly cover every single detail of the art or replace the experience of visiting Men of Steel, Women of Wonder in person. So not only do we hope to see each of you returning to see this exhibition many times over in the next coming months, the galleries are open until nine tonight as well. I would also encourage you to take a look at the catalog produced around this exhibition for further insight into the rich stories of these artworks. You can find this amazing catalog just right outside of the Great Hall doors this evening. The lecture this evening is going to begin with just a brief overview of the exhibition presented by Alejo, and then followed by a conversation with artists Aphrodite Navab and Fahamu Peku. They'll join him on stage and then further share about their work and their perspectives. While Alejo is going to personally welcome Aphrodite and Fahamu later, I'd like to briefly just share a little about our speakers for the evening. Aphrodite Navab is an artist based in New York City of Iranian and Greek descent. Her art has been featured in over 100 exhibitions and is included in a number of permanent museum collections. Navab's most recent solo exhibition, The Homeling, was a Johannes Vaught gallery in New York City. Recently, Navab was invited to join the prestigious Artist in Residence Gallery, which was established in 1972 as the first not-for-profit, artist-directed, and maintained gallery for women artists in the United States. Navab's series, Super East, West Woman, is included in the Men of Steel Wonder of Women exhibition. Fahamu Peku is an interdisciplinary artist and scholar whose works combine observations on hip hop, fine art, and pop culture. Peku's paintings, performance art, and academic work addresses concerns around contemporary representations of black masculinity and how these images impact both the reading and performance of black masculinity. In 2017, Peku was the subject of a retrospective exhibition, Mewad Alome, in Paris, France. He is a recipient of the 2016 Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Award. His work is featured in noted private and public international co collections, including the Smithsonian National Museum of African American Art and Culture, and the High Museum of Art, and of course, here at Crystal Bridges Museum. Specifically, his work, None of My Heroes After Barclay Hendricks' Icon for My Man, Superman, is on view in this exhibition. We are absolutely honored to welcome Alejo, Aphrodite, and Fahamu here this evening, so please join me in welcoming our speakers. Hi, good evening. Um, this, is, this is pretty cool for me. I, um, I, I'm, I've loved these characters for a long time. Um, and in many ways, this is a, this is a dream exhibition. Um, and I, I don't know how many of y'all have had a chance to actually walk through. Um, it's, it's something really special. And, and I hope that uh, if you haven't been through yet, that, that you do uh, take the time to go through afterwards. Um, for me, it all kind of starts with underwear. Um, <laughs> yeah, with, with, with underwear and, and the fact that for 80 years, um, hundreds of different artists and writers who have approached this character, millions of dollars spent on costumes. After all of that, Superman still can't find a better way to keep up his underwear than a belt. I, <laughs> And I mean, he, he truly has uh, belt loops on his, his underwear. And that, that struck me as odd. Um, and, uh, and so I looked into it. And it's actually, uh, it, it's not quite as, uh, as odd as you would think. Um, the reference is actually 
uh, to circus strongmen, like this one that is in the exhibition. Um, this, is the, this is because Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel wanted to uh, immediately signal to folks that this is a powerful character. It's that skin-tight suit, the underwear on the outside, that big chunky belt, all of those things were supposed to uh, indicate to anybody before they even took a look at uh, or read a single, a single word of the comic. Um, and so it occurred to me if, if something as obvious as a big yellow belt uh, was, was right there in front of me all, all this time and I hadn't really thought about it, what other details, what other sort of nuances of this character have I just been overlooking and have, uh, have many people been overlooking? And so um, I turned to uh, the, the best watchdogs of society, artists. Um, our, our artists are, are always able to look at the world around us and, and tell us what we should be thinking about and what we should be looking at. Um, and what you find, or what I found very, very quickly, um, were a lot of really amazing works. So a, a couple of these that, that are in the show, it's, it's Renee Cox going and, and saying, uh, having this, this experience when she went and took her kids to Toys R Us and they were walking through the action figure aisle and they didn't find a single character that was a person of color. And she said, there's something wrong with that. Um, and so she creates her own. She bases it on Wonder Woman. She calls it Rajay. She casts herself in this role wearing Pan-African colors. Um, and she has all the same powers and uh, weaknesses or, or vulnerabilities of this character. Uh, but now with a, with a broader perspective. And there's amazing nuance and, and, uh, and layers that go into how that all plays out in, in this series that she did. Rich Simmons uh, talks about representation, but representation uh, this time as it relates to sexual orientation. And he, he's very overt in the message that he sends when he does this work on, on the right. He, he's, I mean, it's, it's Superman and, and Batman in embracing in, in, this, in, in this passionate kiss. And he says, you know, regardless of his orientation, it's still Superman. He still has all those same powers. And this becomes a, a larger way to think about how that does not affect his work that he does, his ability to save people, um, and that we should look more broadly at, uh, at popular culture, at our daily lives, and think about how sexual orientation clearly does not affect the way that you could do a job. Um, you also have uh, artists like Dulce Pinzon, who is playing off this, this idea that uh, Wonder Woman is an immigrant. Uh, she comes, comes from Themyscira. Superman is not only an immigrant, but he's also coming from space. He's an alien, and he's escaping from an exploding planet, so he's also a refugee. That, that is packed with, with possibility, and uh, particularly Latinx artists are exploring uh, those types of ideas. And so Dulce Pinzon uh, does this large series where she looks at uh, immigrants in New York uh, and, and speaks with them and photographs them wearing superhero outfits. Uh, and, and, and does this and, and talks about how these are uh, everyday heroes that we should be acknowledging and celebrating. And this series is, is, her, uh, is her way of doing that. Um, and then you also have someone like Laurie Anderson um, who thinks about Superman and thinks about how uh, we talk about these characters as American gods. They're these omnipotent, uh, powerful characters. Um, and Superman in particular, he's, he, he's always watching out for us. He's always, uh, he's always looking out for us. He's always watching us, which sounds a lot like Big Brother. And so she relates him to, uh, to this big government power and this thing that should be respected but also perhaps feared. There are a lot of ways. Uh, the, the show explores a lot of these different ways that artists are approaching these characters. And we knew that we wanted to, to tackle uh, as many of them as, as we could. We wanted to uh, address these and, and provide this platform for, uh, for these artists to, um, uh, to or, or actually provide a platform where uh, guests could come see what these artists are doing. Um, and so I, I could walk you through the show, but I, I hope that y'all have either done that or will go do that. And so what I uh, instead thought that I would do is uh, Every, everybody loves an origin story, and so um, I'm going to give you a bit of the origin story of this show. Um, and for me, my, my whole sort of love of these characters actually starts uh, not too long ago. Um, it starts with this. 
with a series of work done by Mike Kelly um, that's the Candor series. And this, uh, if you are a Superman fan, you know that this is like the geekiest of geeky comic book references that you could possibly imagine. Um, the bottle city of Candor was the capital city of his home planet that was shrunken down, kept in a bell jar for decades, and then he, uh, Superman, ultimately finds it and takes it back to his fortress of solitude. It becomes this, uh, this constant reminder of what he does, this metaphor for how he's always uh, looking after uh, these people in here, but looking after, uh, looking after Earth. Um, but then also um, this constant reminder of, of loss for him, this, this point of vulnerability for this character. Um, and to understand that, uh, I had to uh, delve into Superman. I had to uh, read a lot about Superman um, I had to read a lot of comics, um, and uh, I, I should rephrase that. I got to le read a lot of comics under the auspice of, of research, um, which is always fun. And, um, and I became sort of obsessed with this character, and so I, I think this is a big part of how uh, this show actually came into existence, because as I was going through and I was looking at artworks that were in the Crystal Bridges collection, I was, I was trying to think about uh, how we could activate some things that were, uh, that were in here, I came across this work, which I had seen before, but now it was, uh, I was seeing it in sort of a different way. You have these, uh, this is a, a WPA print, one of our labor prints um, in our collection, and uh, it's these big, strong steel workers um, who are actively doing, uh, doing this job. They're sort of soaring over the city, um, and the work is called Men of Steel. Um, and this is, this is kind of a, a, a trope at, at this point with the WPA. They're showing this is how, it's, it's during uh, the Great Depression and it's all of these images of uh, strong men who are going to work and, and actively pulling us out of the Great Depression. Um, Superman iconically rips back his white collar to reveal his blue suit underneath. He is the superheroic extension of that type of idea that it's going to be through physical action that we will uh, pull ourselves out of, out of crisis. This is the character that we created to help do that. Um, and he, uh, the, these steel workers have that, that name, the Men of Steel, long before Superman uh, adopts it himself. Um, and I presented a, a, a very small, or I proposed a very small uh, focus show that looked at some of these ideas sort of uh, around our labor prints. Uh, took it to the curatorial team, and they were very excited about it. And they asked, is, uh, is there any way that this could uh, perhaps expand into something bigger, um, which is the start of this dream, right? Um, and uh, I, of course, said, yes, it can. Um, bear with me while I, uh, while I um, start thinking about this uh, for, for a bit. And very quickly, Wonder Woman came into, uh, came into the picture. Um, and I love this sort of connection to uh, characters like Rosie the Riveter. Um, Wonder Woman burst on the scene in 1941, December of 1941, which is the same month that the US enters World War II. She is from the very outset fighting against Nazis. Um, and much like Rosie the Riveter, she is always pictured as being this very powerful character, but also this character that is expected to be sort of traditionally beautiful and very feminine. Um, and so uh, when, when you look at uh, a work like, like this by Norman Rockwell, you see her compact in her pocket, you see her wearing lipstick. Um, this is the same way that, uh, that, that Wonder Woman sort of operates, that, that from the very outset, um, William Moulton Marston is actually basing his character in part on pinups. And so we incorporate pinups uh, in this section. Um, this, uh, this initial idea for this show, um, this all is still in the show. It's, uh, it's in a section called Origin Stories. Um, and, uh, and, and all of this uh, is exploring this idea and it helps set up that something like uh, Wonder Woman's sensuality, which is something that comes up every time there's a new iteration of that character, was there from the very outset. And it's complex and it's complicated and uh, our relationship with that, uh, with that is, is constantly changing. Um, we culminate this, uh, this origin story section with something pretty cool. Uh, two really pretty cool things. Um, 
the first cover appearances of both of these characters. Um, if you are a comic book fan, um, you, you know how, how cool this is. These are holy grails uh, that, that we have in our gallery for, for three months. Um, and from the very outset, there were these questions about, um, okay, is this, uh, you're talking about doing this show about Superman and Wonder Woman, is it going to have lots of comics in it? Um, and uh, here's, here's the thing, I, I love comics, I, I, I love uh, reading them, um, I think they are uh, an, an art form, I, I absolutely do, and I think that uh, the best way to engage with that art form is to hold it in your hands and advance the narrative yourself, it's not to uh, open it up to one page and have it um, uh, up on a wall, and so in this particular show we really wanted to, uh, we wanted to look at art world responses to uh, these characters and how the art world is sort of engaging with, uh, with these. Um, but we wanted to have this moment um, where we could uh, highlight these two covers um, and we treat them as art objects because that's what they are. Uh, and we have uh, we, the labels that are in there, say Joe Schuster and Harry G. Peter, um, the same way that we would do with any, any other uh, art object. Um, which is a, a very important uh, point and, and something that, uh, that we wanted to make very clear from, from the outset. Um, but again, the, this show is focused on art world responses to, uh, to these characters, and uh, that is, is where I want uh, to take us, because this whole, this whole show uh, is, is pushed along by um, these sort of amazing um, visions of, uh, of these artists. Um, Mel Ramos, the, the late great uh, Mel Ramos, who, who just recently passed away, um, created two incredible works in, in 1962, Superman and Wonder Woman. Um, they are reunited in this show. That in and of itself is a reason to come see the show because that's insane and super cool. Um, and they're hanging right next to each other and they look phenomenal. And, uh, and, and this, is, uh, the, this is something really special that we were, uh, that we were able to do. Um, but I also, uh, I, I got the chance to, to speak with, with Mel and get his uh, ideas about how, uh, why, why he gravitated towards these, these characters, which frankly, um, this is at the front end of, uh, of pop art. This is kind of a radical sort of thing to, to do. Um, but I also got to go and I, I, I did studio visits with artists like Siri Kaur, um, where we got to see these, uh, these big, beautiful photographs that she did, and you have to see them in person um, because she's so meticulous about how it's printed and how you experience this. Uh, and these characters come, come to life for you. You see these impersonators and they feel real as you're standing in, in her studio and talking to her about it. Um, I also got to, to go in and, and meet with uh, Jason Yarmosky, who, um, when I walked into his studio, and uh, <laughs> I, I walked in and he had this work, um, this won't surprise, surprise you, just kind of leaned up against the wall. Um, no big deal, he just, he just had this sort of leaning there and I walked in and I, was, I had seen his work online but not seen it in person um, and it was me trying to play it cool while also trying to have an intelligent conversation with, uh, with this artist about his work and it's powerful work and it's work that uh, is visually striking but then also as you find out about it, as you find out that this is his grandmother who was living with Alzheimer's, and this is, uh, he, he talks about how, uh, you know, one, Wonder Woman goes out and she chooses to fight uh, against supervillains on, on a daily basis. His grandmother would wake up uh, and, and would fight against this disease, and, and she would do it with dignity and bravery, and that's not to say that she was fearless, and in fact, it's, it's a terrifying thing to have to confront every day, but this is, uh, this is her being vulnerable. This is her uh, doing this. There, there's tremendous power in vulnerability, and, and in the show, we, we highlight that. We, we talk about how that is, that is how we can connect with these characters. That, that is why these characters are relevant to us, uh, because we, we can relate to them. Um, and I, I want to talk about just one more, one more project before uh, I, I uh, invite in, uh, Aphrodite and, and uh, Bahamu up. <laughs> it's this. Um, some of y'all may, uh, may know that we worked with the artist Robert Pruitt, um, and uh, we sent an artwork into space, which is pretty cool, and it came back to us. 
Um, and this all started because I had a, uh, a colleague who uh, sent me a message and said, you know, we could send a sculpture into space, which sounds like a crazy idea, but um, Superman's from space and he crash landed in middle America. And uh, I, I thought there was something exciting about that. And uh, Robert Pruitt, is fascinated by Afrofuturism and loves space and has a sweet spot for Superman. And I sent him an email and I got a message five minutes later uh, saying, please let me do this. Um, and he very quickly made it his own and we have a tremendous, uh, tremendous footage of this. This is actually from one of the GoPros that was on this. Um, and we managed to uh, recover it. It had actually landed uh, two and a half hours south of us, um, actually on the property of two farmers. Um, which is just kind of, we couldn't have planned it better. <laughs> um, so with that, I, I could keep talking about, uh, about these artists uh, and, and these ways that we've been able to work with them and, and see their visions. Um, I could keep talking about that for a very long time, um, or I could do the better thing, which is to invite uh, Dr. Fahamu Peku and Dr. Aphrodite Nawab up on stage. So we're going to um, sort of switch over to uh, to a different um, PowerPoint, um, and we're just going to have some images that are that are sort of uh, moving through, um, and we're just going to have a conversation, um, and uh, and yeah, we'll just kind of see see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Superman uh, is, is this uh, iconic character, and he is a character that uh, both of you have returned to on, on, on multiple different occasions uh, in your artwork. And, and I wonder if both of you could talk about your relationship to this character and what the appeal is of that character. Sure, ladies first. <laughs> I'm a nervous. <laughs> okay. So it's a funny story, and it started with basically vulnerability and trauma. And so in 1978, I had seen the Christopher Reeve, you know, original film in Iran. I was a little kid. And my name is Greek because I have a Greek mom who gave me a Greek goddess name in, in Iran. <laughs> my dad's Iranian. So I already grew up learning about pantheons and universes and gods and goddesses, and I had to carry this name Aphrodite in Iran, then Greece and the U.S. But anyway, so 78, I saw Superman in big, big uh, theaters. And every time I saw his cape, it reminded me of Hajj Hanum, who is my grandmother, my father's mother. And Hajj means uh, doing the pilgrimage. And Hanum means lady, so lady of the Hajj means she did Mecca, basically, and she did it not once, but twice. And she was a large, strong, big woman, beautiful. And so I had always seen this cape <laughs> since, you know, that, the 78, as a chador turned, like, falling off, like, basically falling off the head. And so this was then, but then the revolution, uh, Islamic revolution, uh, started 78 through 79. And... I have to tell you, you know, I, they, the cinemas were either shut down or burned, and to me it was extremely um, frightening as a child, but then I was thinking of that cape and flying, and, you know, very soon after we left from Iran forever as a family and lived in, in exile, and I completely connected with this man, as this little girl felt so close like we were siblings. I felt like I lost my homeland. I feel like an alien. When we arrived in 1981, the American hostages were just released in, in Iran. So they, they, they spat on me in the public school, uh, fourth grade classroom, and said, go home, you dirty Iranian. And I was like, uh, you know, it's still painful, but I lost my home. So I think it, it was from trauma and literally trying to cope and heal and understand that it was through visual arts that I basically found a way to say, 
you know, I'm making a new home and I'm making it through the art. I didn't have the words yet. I wasn't speaking English very well, but through visual art, I was finding ways, metaphors, and I think metaphors for healing and maybe cultural um, communication and a different vision than, let's say, the, you know, uh, terrorist Iranian, which like a 10-year-old girl in a, you know, in school doesn't identify with. So I felt like this all was basically germinating and, and growing in me. How did I know that years later during the Axis of Evil speech um, in 2002, uh, former President George W. Bush called Iran, you know, one of the three nations comprising the Axis of Evil. And I was like, wow, when I left Iran, they taught me that the U.S., you know, the Islamic Republic, that the U.S. was the shaitan e the great Satan. And here we are, this many years later, so many cultural ambassadors and people living from Iran making the U.S. their home. And Iran is evil. And I was thinking about those kids in the classrooms and on the playgrounds who would be spat at and other sort of Muslim Americans or from nations that right now are part of the, let's say, Muslim ban. Um, so it is never ending, it hasn't gone away. So I, this, this Superman has turned into something that grew. And definitely from that early age in Iran, that cape became my grandmother's chador. And then in response to the Axis of Evil speech, I invented super East-West woman who was really a metaphorical me. And, and that metaphorical me is at once Iranian, Greek American and doubly evil, chasing the evil that each nation blames the other. So the, the Cape meant a lot, losing homeland, being called an alien. I was called adopted. I learned the word adopted in fourth grade. Kids called me adopted and I was like, I guess I feel adopted. I'm, the US is my adoptive country, but I still have my parents, thank God, and my siblings. So I'm not that adopted. And then, but then I lost my homeland. So I was redefining what these things meant. So I did feel alien-like, adopted, and a refugee all at the same time. So Superman really meant a lot to this little girl from Esfahan, Iran. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think my... Um, introduction to Superman that was probably from the films as well, and, and maybe more specifically, uh, I think it was the second iteration of the film where he was like fighting, um, I forget the guy's name, that, the, the, the other people from... Um, I, I, I wanna see, I, I wanna um, ask the crowd um, to see if, if anyone else knows the answer to this, because I wanna <laughs> gauge how, uh, how big of fans we, we have in here. So please, please. <laughs> oh. Zod, yes. Zod. General Zod. Zod. Yes. So there was a, there was a part in, in that film uh, where Superman is fighting General Zod and you know, his henchmen. Uh, and uh, they're like fighting in the, the middle of the city and there's like a little black boy with an afro who's like, get him, Superman, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and, 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 for me, like that, that moment like still registers really strongly in my mind because it was very rare to have a black person engaged with like Superman. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, I, I cheered that part. You know, we cheered that part because oh look, it's a black guy. You know what I mean? Um, and so you know, thinking about not just you know uh, Superman as an icon because it's a, it's a very common popular archetype that we see repeated a lot, you know, even by, you know, black people in, in popular culture, but yet within the Superman sort of world, it's very rare to see him interacting with people of color, right? Um, and so that was always really striking to me, and I think, you know, it, it, it's like you have this familiarity with Superman, but it's like Superman doesn't know you, you know? Um, and so what does that mean? Like, how do you then make yourself a part of Superman's world? Because Superman's world seems to be the world that everybody wants to be a part of. Yeah. Like, how do you interject yourself into that? And so my engagement with Superman really kind of stems from that. Like, how do you write that script? How do you get you know, into that particular world? And I think we still continue to have those kind of conversations, especially around like superheroes. Like, 
um, you know, who are the black superheroes or where are the black people in other superhero narratives. Um, and so that's, that's kind of, you know, where I land with it. Like, you know, do we actually need a hero? And I think that becomes another uh, question that my works uh, raise because I think um, it's, it, it, it becomes problematic to always wait for somebody to come and rescue you, you know? Like, when do you stand up and fight for yourself? You know? Like, what happens if Superman doesn't show up? Do you just throw in, throw in the towel? Or do you actually get up and throw hands? Yeah. Well, and, and, and so this, uh, this kind of brings up another question for me, because for both of you, um, we, we've seen now on, on the screen, um, we've seen these works uh, that that's feature the two of you. I mean, it, I, that, is, uh, that is you. Yes. Um, and, then, <laughs> and, and then we know that, uh, that uh, it's, it's you, Aphrodite, in the, uh, in the Shador. Um, and so, so I wonder, are, should we be reading these as, uh, as Fahamu and Aphrodite? Are these self-portraits in, in that way? Well, in, in this particular piece, yes. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, the model in 98% of my work, um, but not as myself. But in this particular instance, yes. Um, and this uh, particular piece is, is in response to a work by Barclay Hendricks called Icon for My Man Superman. You know, Superman never saved any black people. Uh, and I've always, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge Barclay Hendricks fan. Uh, but when I did my, I was working on a project at the time uh, called Art History Next, where I was reimagining famous self-portrait works by artists throughout art history, but uh, interjecting myself into the narrative. So for example, I redid uh, Norman Rockwell's triple self-portrait, you know, yeah. or, um, uh, you know, like other like famous self-portraits, man Ray's, you know, man with half beard, you know, like but as reinterpretations using my own body and using myself. Uh, and so, yeah, in this, this particular piece, you know, I, I am, uh, it, it is about me as much as it is about, uh, you know, this idea of writing, you know, writing myself into art history. Uh, and, and also this idea of becoming my own hero, you know, yeah. like in, in my story, it was, um, you know, being frustrated with trying to find my way into the art world, I decided to create you know, my own lane, like rather than wait for a gallery or institution to say, hey, this guy's good, you know, I was like, I'm just gonna kick in the door. And, you know, so this kind of ripping my shirt open, you know, super Fahamu thing is yeah. like me, you know, just taking, taking my own place, yeah. And so that's not me, no, that's, <laughs> that's, that's me in costume. And that's in the Austrian Alps and it's called World Summit because She's in a world summit of one member, only one person at that summit. And, <laughs> and it's a chador clad woman, or she's an she's a, uh, object of curiosity in, let's say, a, a supposedly museum, you know, um, display box. And I, that's, that's me and not me. So it's a, it's a metaphorical me. And in, in, in all my work, uh, there is like the tearful autobiographical side that you'll, you'll hear when I'm invited to speak, but um, it, it's not a day in the life of me at all. A day in the life of me is I'm telling, I'm begging my son to do his homework. <laughs> my daughter is finishing um, college at Columbia, and she's a chemical engineer, so she's sharing with me all these designs. That's a day in the life of me. Um, but this is a metaphorical self, and my kids have grown up with mommy wearing this, mommy doing that, setting up tripod self-timers, and doing things on her skin, but it's all private, and it ends up being abstract work. And in a sense, this is, uh, this is all, all my series, uh, if they're performance-based or not, they're conceptual, they're abstracted from my concrete reality, and they're metaphors. And I feel like, you know, to be, to deeply mine personal history as an artist, you, it's one thing to mine it, it's another thing to be able to open it up for others to enter. So for me, it's like through metaphor, through fiction, it's almost an invitation for people from different backgrounds, different races, different life histories, but maybe they have been outside. Maybe they have felt <coughs> like an alien. Maybe, you know, they can enter it through their 
their road or route, and it's not it's not um, it's not too personal, you know. And I, I feel that that's the difference between confessing and pouring out something raw, which you you definitely need you need that, and you need your people supporting you. But to turn it into something where other people can enter from their own frames, I think that that's when you turn it into symbol and symbolic representation, metaphor, just to sort of distance it away a little bit so that they can enter the piece. So yeah, that, th I'm landing somewhere real that I visit, but I tried many times to land and <laughs> off a high stool and I kept telling my um, photographer to keep retaking the picture <laughs> until I got it right. And so this is, it's a metaphorical self. It's like me directing a, a, a a, a private film that no one really, I didn't think anyone was going to look at these photos. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I want to talk about that because uh, we just saw some of these, and, and this is part of a much larger series. Um, and, and in this, you know, you're, you're standing uh, in this world summit, or you're, you're landing, or you're this object of curiosity. Um, and, and throughout the series, you're doing a bunch of different things, but it's not the sort of um, superhero going and, and punching somebody or, uh, or doing something, so that type of activity. And so I, I wonder if you could speak about that. Well, I'm, I'm a girl from, I'm a child of a revolution. I, I feel like I'm, I, I very much do not believe in war and fighting and brute force and weapons. But then look at me and Superman and I'm adoring this guy and there's always punch and pow and wow. And, but I think... Um, what, what I felt from the very beginning was I always felt like self and other. I felt like friend and foe. I felt like I am at once inside and outside the nation. So in Iran, I was the Greek girl who also had a Greek-American mom. So I wasn't really totally Iranian. In Greece, I was a refugee. And there I was the Iranian who was going to go to America. Then in America, they also told me I'm very foreign. So. I don't belong in America either, and I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm now doubly evil. So I, I felt like, I think from the beginning, this series, consciously, was always me at once, friend and foe. I'm also the, I'm also the enemy. And why that is, is that from the beginning, I think being particularly part of the nations that are called evil, uh, politically, you know, just in terms of propaganda and official, um, government, you know, policies that affect our, our travel lives, like our ability to travel back and forth. I think that I definitely am doing something that's more like a ritualized performance. And I'm at once them and us. I'm at once the enemy and I am also the, the superheroine. And I think in a sense, um, I show how messy it is, but also how solitary this character is. She's, she's really alone a lot of the time. And in fact, if you, if, you, if you look at the series, if you go to my website, you can see this has started since 2002, and it hasn't ended. And the whole reason I haven't ended it, I want to end it. <laughs> I mean, this is, it's moved from performance to photography to drawing and performance, where I ink up my veil, and I roll on a huge white sheet of drawing paper, and then it becomes the impression and rolling of Super East West Woman with her inked up veil. So she's gone through so many transformations. I would like to rest her, but that's not until Iran and the US are friends again. Politically, I mean, we're definitely friends in terms of people who travel and at the people um, level, but it, it's, a, it's a also a political piece. So this performance series won't rest until we are officially friends again. That means travel becomes easy. There's diplomatic representation. There's no embassy. And I, I think that in either country, and I think that um, you know, in terms of this self and other, as a little kid, when you learn that the country you're going to is the nation of evil or Satan, and then years later, when you're living here peacefully and loving and contributing to the nation, then your homeland is called evil. Then you're like, so I thought I'm going to pick this really <laughs> badass woman. <laughs> who has a chador, <laughs> it turns into a cape sometimes, and she's basically chasing away evil that each nation calls each other, and burning wild rue, which is Esfand, and 
in Iran they do it to chase away evil spirits, but she's also wearing Greek evil eye amulets, and she's just chasing away evil across all her identities, and you know, and I, I felt like at the same time, if you look at the series, I'll be at the stock exchange, I'll be on Wall Street, and no one really sees me, and it is another form of being invisible. So at the same time, those were, there were signs then after September 11th, if you see something all over New York City in the subways, if you see something, say something. Well, here was, here was you know, super East West woman, sometimes wearing the chador like my grandmother did, sometimes it was in her, in her mouth, because there's no fastener, there's no, there's no safety pin. Sometimes when you, you need both your hands, you, you hold the veil with your teeth. So here I was walking, and no one noticed me. No one even saw me. A few Japanese tourists took pictures of me as an oddity walking along Wall Street and the stock, stock exchange area. But I felt like even there, she's alone. Even, even there, she's alone. So I felt like this series, it's a must-see. We don't see Middle Eastern women in veils as superheroes. I never saw any of them growing up here, and yet I had such a very fond memory of my grandmother, and I thought, wow, I think it's time that we have someone who can do all these things, but obviously she doesn't really have much of a support network. <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, and, and I wonder, because you, uh, you, you sort of bring up this, uh, this very relevant point of, of representation within uh, w within comics um, and, and within popular culture, but uh, within the sort of comic world, seeing um, uh, seeing yourself in, um, in in these characters, and and I wonder um, if y'all could talk about uh, how how your characters sort of um, add to that that discussion, this this idea of representation, um, and and the the role that the characters that y'all have created um, play into that. Yeah, um, you know, uh, as, as was uh, mentioned uh, in my bio, like my work is uh, considers uh, representations of black male masculinity. Um, and a part of that for me is having grown up um, looking at the types of images that were purported to be, you know, representations of who I was. I never felt like I fit into any of those descriptions. Um, and so my work, you know, I see it as like a, as an intervention for, um, for, for people to be able to see not only reflections of themselves, but to, to allow us to look at images that invite us to engage with them critically um, and thoughtfully uh, and to see the complexity and the humanity uh, in them. And so my character, um, and again, I, you know, I'm using my own uh, my own body as a way to have these conversations, but by taking on all these different like stereotypes and various types of representations, but repeatedly being my face, you know, um, in my body in these images, I think it creates a space for people to to uh, approach the work differently. Like, wait, but the last time he was looking like this, you know, last time he was in a suit, but this time his pants are sagging. Like, you know, so it's like you are forced to ask yourself a different set of questions about what you're looking at, um, as opposed to just being able to come to it with a preconceived idea or preconceived notion about what you're viewing. Um, and I think that that becomes a, a really uh, generative way for people to have a, a conversation and a dialogue about representation and about identity. Um, and one of the things that has been really surprising to me, you know, especially in the beginning, was that um, even though my work is, is very sort of like rooted in these questions and conversations around uh, black male masculinity, th at the core of it is just questions about human identity. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it doesn't matter what your identity is, you can find a, a point of reference, a frame of reference um, within the work to engage and ask your own self questions about your own identity and how your own identity is being portrayed and how it might be challenged by who you actually are. Ah, that's beautifully said. So <laughs> I, I feel very much the same. You know, I felt like, I mean, look at me. I'm not 100% anything. <laughs> I'm, I, we did 23 and Me, my dad and, and me, and he's definitely like 98% West Asian. His family didn't leave Esfahan for centuries. <laughs> and the first time anyone mixed my dad's family was with this Greek, my mom. So 
her family mixed with all the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. uh, Greek, Italian, Spanish. I have that in my other half. But my Iranian half is like, it's all, it's all Esfahan. It's like all, the, the genes are located by other people living in, in Esfahan, Iran. And so here I am, I'm a, I'm a mutt, I'm a hybrid. And I, I grew to love hybridity. And then when I was, uh, I had gone to Harvard undergrad, fell in love with art. I had, I had gone to Columbia, did my doctorate in art and education, fell in love with cultural studies theories and post-colonial theory. I felt like it, it, it made me understand and have a lens so much better on what was happening to so many people who, um, who've had to migrate, relocate. And um, so one of the things that I thought a lot about was hybridity and how that gives you that, that third space. You're, I'm, I'm not 100% anything. I don't know who is, but you know, I, I'm 50%, and they always remind me, I'm only half Greek. I'm only half Iranian. Where are you from? Well, you only look half this and half that, and actually, you don't really look that Iranian. You don't even really look that Greek. You don't even really look that American, but your accent's American now. So other people tell me where I belong and don't belong, and I think that it's through art I found very early on I can create that, that mm -hmm. third space. And um, cultural studies series, Homi Baba talks mm -hmm. about that third space of unhomeliness. And I get tearful talking about home and homeland and loss of home and people telling me I'm adopted and then all of that. But I had to find the way to speak back. And I think that since that playground experience, I didn't have smart, sassy words to to talk back to them, but then I developed it through art, and I feel like it's my way to say, hey, listen, we can create other symbols, other visual representations. We can offer other ideas. Mm -hmm. We can offer to the world and to kids and future generations alternative views. And so my Hajj Khanum was not a passive grandma who was uh, forcefully veiled. Actually, she voluntarily veiled during the time in Iran when there was mandatory unveiling since the 1930s until the Islamic Revolution, and then, then it became the, the mandatory reveiling act. So as a girl in between the generations, I was like, well, for me, it should be choice. And I think I, very early on, I felt like, we shouldn't force people to do any of that. There should be a choice if you want to dress more or dress less or, you know, and still be in a civil society. So that chador to me, I felt like I had never seen, once I came to the US, a woman who could have these super strengths and be an ambassador, be a sort of cultural ambassador and self, a volunteering diplomat or something that nobody asked for, nobody invited, no one's paying, just doing these things for free. And this chador is not keeping her um, stuck and frozen and passive. She's actually an active agent. And that's why I really, I wanted to offer that as a, another way to represent Middle Eastern women. They can choose the veil, they could not choose the veil. This is not like me speaking for everyone. It's just this girl from Iran, who's also Greek and now American, feels like you can use these metaphors for larger visions. And it could be one where a veiled woman turns into a superhero. And so I, I think that we can't do enough with um, representation in the media, especially. And I'm using camera and photography because that affected me deeply. I, I just, I, I discovered with my son um, a Time magazine I kept as a little girl. It was a Time ma magazine with Ayatollah Khomeini on it. And the images and the way they depicted him was very frightening. And it was a very different image in Iran. He seemed very sweet like a very, very benevolent older man, like the Pope is depicted, or was depicted in many of the books. When I came to the US, the way he was depicted was so frightening, so scary, and even satanic or demonic. Mm -hmm. And I knew, I knew when, when I was at college and I learned darkroom and black and white photography, I, I knew that photographs can make and break images of people and identities and races and cultures. So I knew I was going to do something with the camera and performance-based work. And I thought, 
well, why don't I al uh, offer an alternative vision of the Middle Eastern woman? And it took a hybrid person who's neither, I can't claim being 100% anything, but I'm 100% committed to offering a vision that doesn't stereotype, that isn't narrow. I think that's me. That's my home. <laughs> um, Hamza, I want to uh, ask you, um, this has been, been going around, and uh, a question that we've gotten even just in uh, the, the day that, that the show has been open, um, across the top, uh, it says, ain't nothing but a sandwich. Um, can you talk about that reference yeah, and why you included sure. that? Yeah, so um, that, that saying, um, as you, you pointed out, I wasn't aware of the film. I had seen, the, uh, seen that it was a, a, a book. Um, but I didn't realize that there was also a film about it. But uh, it was a, a sort of popular sentiment or expression, you know, post-civil rights era, like, you know, the black community that a hero ain't nothing but a sandwich, you know. Um, and I've, you know, heard that, you know, repeated many times, and it just made sense, you know, uh, in, the, in the conversation of that piece, um, that if you're waiting on a hero, you know what I mean? You might be waiting for a long time, so you might as well, you know, become your own hero, uh, which is why, as opposed to there being an S on the chest, you know, of, of the character in the painting, it's an F, you know, for, for Hamu. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, but that's, that's essentially the idea that, you know, uh, and, and Aphrodite and I were talking about this um, in the green room a little earlier. Uh, it, it's kind of frightening, you know, at this, in this day and age, you know, to make heroes out of external people, you know what I mean? Like our icons, you know, and, and heroes, people that we look up to, you know, have proven to be quite fallible. Um, you know, and I always joke around and say, be careful who or what you put on a pedestal, because those things have a tendency to fall down. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's a similar idea, like, uh, you know, while we're waiting, you know, or, or while we're making heroes out of people, we're actually stripping ourselves of a power that, that often we're not aware that we have. Um, and I think it's important, you know, especially uh, in, in the black community that we become more aware of our power and that we stop waiting on somebody to come, like waiting on salvation, you know, like salvation happens when you do the work to save yourself. Um, I, I want to open it up for, for questions, um, but I, I, I want to ask one more question okay. of, of Bahamu. Um, this is not the first time that uh, you've sort of cast yourself as, as a hero. Um, and uh, I, I know that when you were, when you were younger, you mm -hmm. had a, a, a hero that you had created. Yeah. Um, should you talk about, sure. about him? <laughs> Look, he, he, he dug in the crates. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, from the time I was nine years old, well, even before that, I knew I wanted to be an artist. I didn't know quite how, you know. People were like, you know, if you're going to be an artist, you're going to be poor, or you have to be a starving artist. I was already pretty skinny, and didn't need to starve, <laughs> too. Um, and so, uh, you know, when I was about nine years old, I learned about uh, cartoon animation as a career. Uh, and so from the time I was nine, you know, I decided that I was going to be a cartoon animator. And my goal was actually to be the black Walt Disney. Um, and, uh, you know, so as an as, as a, a aspiring cartoonist, I began to create my own cartoons and my own characters. And when I was in middle school, I created a character called Black Man, um, who was, you know, the, the, the character was actually inspired by me. It was a young uh, boy who was my age. His name was Ahmad. Uh, he lost his father, um, you know, who his father was killed mistakenly by a drug dealer. Um, and uh, his father, uh, Ahmad's father, was a scientist who had been creating this like new technology that could transform molecules. Uh, and Ahmad, in his grief, was going through his father's journals and found the notes for the, the molecular transformer and realized that his father never completed it because he was doing like miscalculating something. And Ahmad, being a genius himself, figured out what was missing, and he was able to create this molecular transformer and miniaturized it and put it into a ring. Um, and he would transform himself into a black man and go out and fight crime, which meant the drug dealers and things in his uh, community um, as a way to like, you know, uh, you know, as a tribute to his father, but also as a way to kind of help his community. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I did this comic book for 
from the, about the age of 12 until I got to college. You know, when I was in middle school, I would sneak into the library before school started and Xerox the copies that I had drawn the <laughs> night before and sell them to my friends in the cafeteria for like 50 cents. You know? um, I, was, I was quite the entrepreneur. Um, but uh, it was, uh, it, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, a lot of fun to work on and, and the character had, you know, many different iterations. There were, of course, you know, supporting characters and things like that. But it was, you know, always responsive to what was actually happening in the world. Um, and, but yeah. yeah. That's black man. Awesome. Um, I, I think at this point uh, we have some time for uh, Q and A. If there, uh, if there's anybody who has some questions. We'll oh be wow, there's people here. We can't see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be passing a mic. So if you have a question, just raise your hand high. There's a lot of people here. Yes. <laughs> We have one. I was just, uh, just wondering if uh, the difference between like archetypes and people that we like elevate as heroes that are real people. You know, like how what do you what do you see as a difference there, and is it healthy to have one or the other? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely think that um, that there is a distinction between archetypes and actual people. I mean, you know, archetypes represent ideas um, or ideals, um, and you know, oftentimes we can find those ideals, you know, portrayed in the actions and behaviors and efforts of individuals. But I think as that, that human, human beings are human beings, like they're, they're fallible, they're not perfect, they're not Superman, they're not, you know, even Superman can be harmed, you know, even Superman can be hurt. Um, but the ideals that Superman stands for, you know, prove themselves to be uh, true. And if we aspire to those ideals as opposed to aspiring to be the people who represent those ideals, I think we'll find ourselves in a safer space. My question is, uh, what other artists do you guys happen to be fans of or happen to look at or happen to inspire this work? Uh, the name Trent Doyle Hancock comes to mind. So just curious about that. Uh, well, for me, I think Obviously, Barkley Hendrix uh, is one of those uh, art heroes of mine. Um, earlier today, we were walking through the galleries, and uh, I shared with um, Aphrodite and our friend Jenny uh, that when I did make that transition from animation to painting as a college student, the work that I really gravitated to, the artist that really inspired me to become a painter, was Alice Neal. Um, and her yeah. paintings are in the uh, exhibition upstairs. And I, I, like, she was literally a hero for me. Like, when I saw her paintings, I was like, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, in the best way, like, yeah. like oh yeah. man, I feel inspired. Oh, to no, do no, that. like, yeah, certainly. Like, I, I was really drawn, you know, by uh, really drawn into her mark making, really drawn into the gaze of her figures. Uh, stylistically, I just, it, it was arresting. Um, and I, I, I didn't feel the same way about a painter until I saw Barclay Hendricks' work. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Um, actually, after I graduated from a Harvard undergrad, I took my parents to their first like exhibition at the Whitney. I took them there because I wanted to tell them, Mom, Dad, I want to be an artist for life. And they're like, you're not going to be a medical doctor. You're going to starve. <laughs> and, and, Bahama and I are both kind of small <laughs> for these superheroes that are big. <laughs> We're thin. I've been, I've been like this all my life. And I was like, star? Well, I mean, I'm, I, I'm already pretty small and thin. <laughs> and um, so I took them to the show. It was Ana Mendiata. Um, and she was from Cuba. And I didn't know anything about her. And it was a, a, a huge show, floor of her work. And my, she did performance-based work and earthworks. and. It was very moving. So I had gone from documentary photography. The first documentary works were on my father, my mother's mother, my grandmother, Ifigenia, who passed away, and, and on my mother. And I did everything. It, it really did start with family, home, culture, identity. Um, so that was my documentary work. But when I seen Ana Mendiata stuff, I felt like I connected so much being a kid and also feeling like like a refugee and adopted and in this country and 
feeling displaced and trying to find connection with the land, the earth, the people. And so I, I, I definitely was inspired to do more performance-based work after that exhibition. And I, you know, I think ever since then, I, I don't know, I was destined to be re-inspired and continuously um, inspired by her. And the gallery that I'm a member of, um, uh, Artists in Residence, AIR, which uh, Moira had mentioned earlier, it's the first women's collective in the US. And it was founded because women were highly underrepresented in galleries and museums. And Anna Mendiato was one of the founding members. So I was like, I didn't know. But, and it was a rigorous, competitive you know, process to be a member. And you go through, it's like uh, applying for college. <laughs> and, and it's something that, um, I, it, to me, it's like a full circle. So to, to be with uh, a women's collective that Anna Mendiata had been a ma uh, founding member of, and it was also the first place she could curate a show uh, works by other you know, artists that she felt very inspired by. So it was also her curatorial debut, which people didn't know about. She made art and she also curated it. And so I, you know, I, if I were to say Ana Mendiata, but then I also do a lot of abstract work, you know, in drawings and, and um, they tend to be organic or sexual or body parts or it's all from imagination and fantasy. And I would say Louise Bourgeois, who's right outside, is my other, she's, she's my artistic mother. I feel like Anna Mentiata was a sister, <laughs> really do. And uh, Louise Bourgeois was, uh, is my artistic mom. So. Awesome. Do we have time for maybe one more? Uh, one, I want to thank you both for being here. Uh, your work is amazing. Uh, I'm a school teacher, and I found the reason I chose that career was because I love science. But in my career, I found that I've ended up mentoring people. Uh, you guys chose the career of art, but your subject puts yourself in the role of an example and a hero and a mentor. Uh, do either of you have any stories where people have come up to you and thanked you for your work or where it stood out to you, uh, where you've made a difference in people's lives, even though both of you are trying to get over that struggle? of you need a hero, you've kind of put yourself in the role of that hero. Is there anything you can share with us that you've experienced? Sure, uh, I have uh, two quick ones, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so the first one um, uh, happened when I was an undergraduate student. Uh, I, I went to the Atlanta College of Art uh, and um, uh, when I was a junior, just after I kind of made the transition from being an animation major to a painting major, uh, I was listening to uh, an album uh, by Goody Mob. Uh, anybody know Goody Mob, hip hop group? <laughs> uh, and so on their first album, they have a song called Guess Who, uh, where each of the guys talks about their mother and the, the impact of their mother's love, you know? I lost my own mom when I was four years old, and uh, I instantly like connected with that song. And I began to make work inspired by that song about my own mom, uh, and the night that she died. You know, my siblings and I were all witness to it, but we never talked about it, we never discussed it, anything like that. And so I made this whole body of work. It was very intimate, it was very personal. I couldn't even explain why I was doing it, but it became my senior thesis exhibition. And the night that the show opened, the, the place is packed with, you know, uh, with people, and I'm standing back watching people react to the work, and I see people break down crying, people are like, you know, really emotional, and I had all these people start coming up to me like, thank you for doing this. You know, I haven't spoken to my brother in 15 years because we had an argument over such and such, but this work makes me want to reach out to him and, you know, uh, and, 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 and make up for what happened, or somebody else was like, you know, you know, I lost my own mom when I was a child, and this work gives me the courage to deal with it. You know what I mean? It was like everybody's reaction was something like that, and it was really powerful for me, and I remember you know, again, standing back thinking like, so this is what art is. This is what I want to do. Like, I don't want to make pretty pictures. I want to make art that will make the world a prettier place, you know? Um, and that's, that's awesome. so,
So that's, you know, that, that was the first one. The second one, it was more recent. And as I mentioned before, you know, my work engages with like representations of black masculinity. And, you know, one of the challenges that I've always had as an artist that, you know, deals with the subject matter, but I'm showing my work in galleries and museums is that oftentimes uh, the audience that is engaging with this work doesn't look like the audience that I'm having a conversation with. Um, and so I'm always like trying to figure out like how to make my work more accessible to that community, to a community of young black men. Um, and I had a show in New York a few years ago. It was called All That Glitters Ain't Goals. Um, and um, the show engages with like hip hop and the kind of like bling culture of hip hop and all this kind of stuff, but it's kind of a, a critique. And as a part of the show, uh, I created a series of paintings, but I was like, I need to figure out a way to get young black men to see this work, and they may not go to the gallery. So I ended up recording a hip hop album, all original music, um, and every painting has a song that goes along with it. So when you view the work in the gallery, you can scan a QR code and download the song and you know, have this uh, engagement. But anyway, one day, um, the, the gallery's in New York, it's on 24th Street, and um, my gallerist loves to tell this story about there was a group of like teenage boys, like black boys walking down the street and one of my paintings was in the window. And they walked by and they kind of stopped and they're looking at it and they kind of stuck their head in the door but they were like apprehensive about coming into the gallery. And so he was like, you know, you, you can come in. And they, you know, so they came in, they spent some time walking around looking at the artwork and they were like, this is, this is art? Like, I get this, I understand this. Oh, when he does this, this is what he's talking about. Or, or this is saying such and such, or this is a line from this song, you know what I mean? It was like, they had this instant, immediate connection and then he was like, the next day they came back with friends, you know, to show them the work. And, and, and those kind of moments for me are like really touching. It's like, this is why I do it, you know, is to have these connections. And again, to, to create a space uh, of, of visibility, to, to create a space where black men can see themselves see themselves represented holistically. Wow. I, I can't be this articulate or specific, but I'm, I'm, I was thinking of all sorts of um, times when like, you, you make work and it, it's a gift. You give it out to the world and it has a life of its own and you have to really part with it. And uh, you know, I gave birth to two kids, and I know what labor is like, and I know when they separate from you, and uh, and when they grow up into independent uh, creatures and individuals. So I feel like art is very much like that. And um, over the years, I I would get surprised. Like I don't know, I'd have a photograph at the Harn Museum that they'd bring out of their permanent collection, and then there would be a course around um, deorientalization of Iran and Middle Eastern American artists who challenge stereotypes. And I had a series called I'm Not a Persian Carpet, and I took um, wooden blocks that had Persian carpet uh, motifs on it, and like the patterns on the carpet, except they were blocks, like print make for, for inking. And I used my son's, uh, no, at that time it was my daughter's black ink, and I, I inked up my abdomen and set up a tripod, and all you could see is this woman's different body parts, but nothing was sexual. It, you, just arms or stomach or a leg, but it had the pattern of like, as if I were tattooed or branded or run over by a carpet. <laughs> <laughs> and that, it was during the embargo, uh, when there was an embargo on all goods from Iran, like lucrative ones, ca caviar um, and Persian carpets. And so I would discover these things over the years where uh, someone would go and tell me they saw my photograph there and, or there was a, uh, an article or uh, even a course where they, they took my publications and used it in their um, courses on uh, visions of the East, deorientalization, orientalism, and Saeed's um, a critique of uh, it. And, there were so many things, like, it, it, I'm just trying to think. And then someone was at the Low Art Museum and I have two photographs in their permanent collection there and there was a whole bunch of grad students. And I think in one of them, uh, they were moved by me looking at a, a fake Kajar painting. Uh, it's a copy in my parents' uh, living room and it's a Kajar princess. And, and in it, um, and you could see it on my website too. 
and also the low brings it out every bunch of years. And I am wearing a, uh, a blanket, but it looks like a chador. And I'm staring at this beautiful princess in an oil painting. And I'm asking, where do I fit in with this older painting tradition that was exclusively male? So I was asking a question through art and through my camera and tripod. And, and in the end, you see like a, a contemporary mixed Iranian Greek American trying to find out where is her home, where is her place, and paying homage to one of her artistic tradition. So they had a whole course around that and representation, self, other women, women's body. And um, something interesting to me is recently, you know, sometimes I do a Google search of my name, which is crazy because it's Greek, my middle name is French, last name is Persian. No one else has this <laughs> weird combination that my parents came up with. So there's only one of me in the world. And I, I looked around on Google and I saw a former, former student was published in a major, um, he's, a, he's a major photographer right now and, uh, in a magazine, and photography magazine. And they asked him, when did he get inspired? And how was it he started to think of concepts and ideas? And he mentioned Professor Aphrodite Desiree Nabob. And I'm like, huh? Wait, how did I miss this article? How come I never even heard from this? I don't, no one even sent me a copy. And so I found this article, and it basically he said, I mean, he said it more eloquently, something like, I was in her course. I was bored to death and stuck and blocked with my series. And I was really, really in artist block. And then she said, why don't you think of something that moves you, and like an idea and a concept, and let that, let that guide you. So I guess the emphasis on coming up with something authentic inside that inspires you, concept and an idea behind the work. And um, seeing these things, I, you, I don't, I mean, unless I did research, I would never have known that was out there in the world. This touches me because, you know, you hope that you, you do touch people and you do move people and you get them, you get them to ask questions. So my biggest thing in my courses, my artwork, my writing is, why don't you ask a question through your medium? And you're not gonna come up with all the answers. And I distrust any total system that answers everything. I, I'm very suspicious of all totalitarian things. But to ask questions, to come up with alternatives and solutions, I think we can do that through any form, any medium, and, and schools should be a place of that. And, and the whole world becomes, you know, uh, it's a life learning. I just feel it's like lifelong learning, continuing education. So I think um, th these are the sweet surprises. So I can't think of one particular thing, but it's been a flow. And just uh, during Thanksgiving, I see someone tag me on Instagram. And I'm like, who's this person in Mexico? And it's a doctoral candidate. And it was my published dissertation. Um, it says, Deorientalizing Iran, um, and it was a critique, and, a and it, it's my name, and it was a PowerPoint presentation in Mexico City, <laughs> and all these people I didn't know, and it was a big thing, and he tagged me, I didn't know who he was, and I did more research, and I was like, wow, his doctoral studies, and then we contacted each other, doctoral studies is focusing on uh, deori deorientalizing um, the East, and how it has been stereotyped in the West from 1800s on. And, um, and it, but my, my book was up there like that, like, a, <laughs> like a, a work of art. And I was like, what? Total stranger. And this, is, this to me is so exciting because we don't know each other. And I, it, it was work and writing and art that brought us together and ideas. And, um, and hopefully, if he comes to the US, We'll meet each other, and and it's going to continue. So I think it's these are the these are the unexpected but very sweet surprises along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both, Bahamu and, and Aphrodite, uh, and thank you all for for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, that's good. <laughs>